This is Christopher Yost, and you're watching the TV Writer Podcast. Hosted by Gray Jones, the TV Writer Podcast is brought to you by Script Magazine and ScriptMag.com, the leading source for script writing information in print and on the web. And by Final Draft Script Writing Software, the entertainment industry standard for script writing worldwide. My name is Gray Jones, and I want to welcome you to the TV Writer Podcast, partner of Script Magazine, episode 37 for Thursday, October 13th, 2011. Well, today is kind of a part two. Last week, we spoke to David Diaz, who was an animation writer in uh, in kids and, and youth animation. And now, um, this week, I'm very, very excited to present animation writer, story editor, and Marvel Jack of All Trades, Christopher Yost. And Christopher has worked on some really, really exciting titles for the teen and up audience. Titles that you might recognize like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Fantastic Four, Next Avengers Heroes of Tomorrow, Hulk vs. Wolverine, The Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes. Um, he's worked in comic books, uh, writing for Marvel's X-Men and Spider-Man franchises and DC's Batman franchise. As well, he did the adaptation of the sci-fi classic Ender's Game. And also, he even uh, did his own creator-owned original graphic novel, Killer of Demons, which debuted in March 2009 to great acclaim. Um, he is currently writing in the Marvel Writers Program, and he's helping to develop potential live-action feature properties. So really, really exciting stuff, and I'm sure you're going to love this interview. As a matter of fact, why don't we go right to it? Enjoy. This is great, and I'm here with animation writer, story editor, and Marvel jack-of-all-trades, Christopher Yost. How are you doing, Chris? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great, thanks. Oh, can I call you Chris? Yes, absolutely. Perfect. Well, um, I'm so excited to uh, hear your side of the story because last week we, we spoke to another animation writer, and he, he writes in the sort of um, children's and, and young adults area, and you've written in some of the, the, the much more well-known, perhaps, um, for teens and older uh, Marvel titles, especially, and, and some DC in there as well. Uh, yeah, I've done uh, a little bit of everything. I've worked on like the Batman animated series, uh, the more recent one. Uh, I've done Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I've done a little bit here and a little bit there. So great, great. Well, um, why don't we roll right back to where you started? You were you were born in Missouri. I was born in Missouri. It's true. Um, about I think it was about twelve or thirteen, I moved up to Michigan. To Michigan. Okay, so that's that. I know that you ended up as an advertising producer there. So how did that happen? I went into undergraduate at University of Michigan, fully intending to be like a computer science major. And about a week in, I realized it was not for me. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, you know, just looked at the course back and tried to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And they had a film and TV section. They had a uh, University of Michigan had a major called film and TV studies. Mm -hmm. So I uh, switched majors from computer science to film and never looked back. Um, mm. You know, at University of Michigan, at least, you know, in 1991, it was largely like film criticism, you know, mm. film theory, film history, that kind of thing. And I mean, you know, what did I know? I wasn't thinking about it too much. So I, uh, you know, got to watch a lot of movies and talk about movies and write about movies and, you know, put together a little Super 8 shoot and just did kind of random stuff. Mm. And then uh, once I graduated, I'm like, oh, what do I do with that? <laughs> uh, and then got into advertising locally. Uh, I worked for uh, a few different ad agencies out in Michigan and ended up at a place called Ogilvy in May there mm -hmm. and did uh, did some car commercials. Cool. So I was a, uh, a producer uh, in advertising. Now, so you did that for a few years, um, but then eventually you got the bug to do animation and also producing I'm guessing, because you ended up in the Peter Stark program at USC. Um, so w at what point did you decide that you, you had to move out west? It was, I think, about my 10,000th commercial for brakes and, uh, you know, shock absorbers and oil changes. Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, you know what, there's probably a little more to life than this. Uh, you know, the ad thing was a great job, don't get me wrong. And, you know, I got to do, you know, a lot of fun stuff. We had like a snowmobile client. So every year we'd go up in the mountains and shoot snowmobiles and it was well. a blast. But, but, you know, I'm like, you know, life's short. And the worst that could happen is, you know, it doesn't work out and I come back and I get back into advertising. Mm -hmm. Luckily that didn't happen because, you know, the entire automotive industry kind of has its issues now. But, yeah. uh, 
I got into the Peter Stark program, and, you know, it's funny, because about a, a month into that, I realized it wasn't for me either. Oh, no. Uh, that's that's kind of my thing, I guess. Uh, yeah. So I, you know, but you know, I was going to get an MFA out of it. So I'm like, you know, the worst going to happen is I, you know, get the degree. So I uh, kind of stuck with it, and we had a few courses that were like, you know, like how to how to think like a writer, or you know, like dealing with writers from the perspective of a producer. Because mm-hmm. Peter Stark was, it's a great program, and I mean, I I am thankful and lucky to have uh, gone through it because you know it really taught me like you know how this town kind of works and like how people think and how they talk and i would i definitely would not be where i am without it Mm -hmm. only in the sense that i you know met so many great people and still you know work with people from that program today Mm -hmm. but you know in a class where we got a chance to write you know a little bit i just kept writing so I, i i got through the program and you know wrote a couple of different feature specs while i was there Hmm. And then the other thing that happened while I was there was that we had to do an internship. And I, I knew Marvel had an office out in L.A. So I called him up and said, hey, you need any help? And uh, at, at that moment, uh, they did. Hmm. And that moment lasted for almost 10 years. <laughs> almost. Very, very cool. It uh, it was, you know, just like a, the perfect scenario of right time, right place, right, uh, right everything. Hmm. So you went into uh, interning and development at Marvel Studios, and you went to, on to write a script for X-Men Evolution, which, uh, which launched your career. Tell me about that opportunity and how that happened. Yeah, at the time, Marvel West, as it was known, was really only like three people. It was like Avi Arad, Kevin Feige, and Craig Kyle, who was kind of like, you know, headed up the animation division. And they had a show on the air at the time called X-Men Evolution. And uh, Craig had read, you know, was gracious enough to read my my screenplays and liked what he read. And he had an idea for an episode. And he's like, hey, do you want to work together on this? And I'm like, yeah, of course I do. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. He had created this character for the show named X-23, who was a clone of, of the character Wolverine. Mm-hmm. And we wrote uh, together the, the first episode with her. And then we, uh, the story editor at the time, Greg Johnson, on that show, you know, didn't think our script was horrible, so he's mm-hmm. like, "Hey, you want to do a few more?" So we uh, we did a few more of those, and and uh, that show kind of wrapped, and then I was able to actually get work on. I think the Batman was my next thing, mm-hmm. and then you know Craig obviously was still working full time to this day at Marvel, so I kind of broke off on my own for a little bit there in animation at least. Now he and I still work together on the comic book side, but. Uh, I don't think Marvel would have been too happy had he worked on the Batman at the time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I I got worked on Batman off of the X Men Evolution scripts and mm-hmm. uh, and after that Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and and the rest is history. Cool. So so um, you've got a bunch of different credits and a bunch of different things and and now I, I know I know you glanced over that a bit, but. Is it kosher to go from Marvel to DC like that, or, or, or are they separate camps? I don't know much about um, how, how it works down there. You know, in animation, I don't think it's a big deal at all. Because, mm-hmm. um, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's a, a, you know, the particular pool of writers in L.A. that do, you know, kind of like the superhero animation, and, you know, we're all, we're all buddies. So it's, you know, it's everybody that works at either side loves it all, you know. So, like, you know, Marvel people love the DC stuff. DC people love the Marvel stuff. You know, with the comic books, you know, they're freelancers. Some are exclusive, some aren't. You know, it just depends what your particular deal is. Yeah. So at what at what point did you get into writing comic books as well as the TV? Well, that actually came through uh, the X-23 character as well. Oh, the, really? Um, okay. The X-23 character premiered in X-Men Evolution, and uh, Craig actually, you know, in talking to guys like Joe Quesada and Dan Buckley, you know, the character came up and... And Joe Quesada, uh, who was editor in chief at the time, wanted to bring the character over to the the print side. Wow! So he told Greg that he wanted to work up like a little origin miniseries, mm-hmm. and you know, Greg and I uh, worked it up. Wow! That must have been exciting. Yeah, it was amazing because you know, at, you know, at, at the same time, like working on animation was great. And, you know, I loved it. At, you know, I'd been reading comic books all my life, and the idea of having my name on a comic book was just kind of blew my mind. Yeah, I, I can remember um, I used to be in a rock band. It was sort of the, the tail end of, of vinyl. And we always said we wanted, like, it, like there was something about if you could cut a vinyl record that was just awesome. And I can imagine <laughs> having your name on a comic book being, being something kind of like that. 
that's exactly what it was. It was just, it's still to this day to see my name on a comic book. It still just trumps everything for some yeah. reason. Yeah, very cool. And then you, uh, I mean, you, you describe yourself now as a jack of all trades, but you did start to have your hand in a lot of different things. You, you were head writer and story editor for Fantastic Four and, and for, um, Iron Man Armored Adventures, The Avengers, Earth's Mightiest Heroes, but then you also were involved in, uh, DVD full features, um, Next Avengers and, and Hulk versus Wolverine. Tell me about writing these different formats. Yeah, you know, it started with the animation for sure, and then kind of segues into the comic books. But I mean, you know, after I, you know, did some freelance script writing for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Marvel Animation called me back and asked me to pitch on Fantastic Four as kind of like the story editor, kind of head writer. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I, you know, put down my thoughts on what I thought the show should be and the tone and all that good stuff. And I did some sample, you know, here's what I would do kind of stuff. And, and I got the gig. So that kind of was my first kind of story editing head writer uh, position. Mm -hmm. And we did uh, 26 episodes of Fantastic Four, which, you know, were, was a great experience and a ton of fun mm -hmm. uh, that was on Cartoon Network. And then at the same time, they're developing other stuff. You know, the features are, you know, kind of hitting <clears throat> every year. There's a different Marvel feature out, so they want to, you know, do a show to support it. So there was an Iron Man show, and then you know, gearing up for, uh, there was another X-Men series that I, I worked on you know, just on a freelance basis. But then, you know, the entire kind of Marvel film initiative is kind of geared towards the Avengers. Hmm. So they've got Iron Man and Cap and Hulk and Thor out in the movies, and it's all going to, you know, in 2012, it's going to be the big Avengers movie. Oh, can't wait. So they wanted to have an animated app, and, and uh, they asked me what I'd do. Now, kind of in between these series, mm -hmm. you know, Marvel had been doing kind of a series of uh, animated features, you know, for DVD. Yeah. So they started off with, uh, you know, Ultimate Avengers, Ultimate Avengers 2, and and I uh, I got to do a little bit of work, you know, here and there on those, just like helping out. But uh, there was a property called Next Avengers that was really a younger property. Mm hmm and given that I'd done some of the the younger stuff, you know, for the series, they uh, they talked to me about that one, and I put together a pitch, and and they liked it. Great. So I was able to. That was my first actual, um, you know, long format animation thing. Mm -hmm. But then that led to Hulk versus, which was you know I, uh, a fan favorite. People really responded to that one. Mm -hmm. Well, so tell me a little bit about. Um... Like it sounds like you 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 got a lot of these opportunities from people that you knew, um, but how separate are these divisions? Like like is it completely different sets of people who are doing the DVD features versus the um, the, the 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 series work, or or are they people that hop back and forth, or or how does that work? You know, back in the day, it's uh, you know it's gone through a few changes since I kind of started there. Back in the day, with on the animation side. The animation was kind of wholly different than, you know, the film side or the comic book side. I mean, there are fairly separate initiatives all across the board. And, you know, as everything kind of progressed, they got closer and closer together. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, like, you know, the animation is now really trying to support what's going on in the movies, and the comic books are trying to mirror what's going on in the movies and the animation. And, but, you know, at the time, the the DVD line was, you know, kind of its own thing. Mm -hmm. Now, Craig Kyle, who worked on the series animation, you know, uh, was also heading up the the, the, the animated DVDs. But uh, the animated DVDs were just kind of like the next step up. So, you know, guys like Javi Arad and Kevin Feige were involved, you know, in those. Mm -hmm. I mean, they had a, a higher profile and, you know, more money. So everybody had to be kind of on board. Yeah. Jumping back a bit to um, the uh, the series work, uh, just so, so the viewers can understand, at least as I understand it, um, in live action, the, you would have the showrunner who would be accepting. I mean, it's a, it's a it's a little different because generally there's a room full of people and and breaking the stories and and uh, and brainstorming and pitching is is all kind of done by a group sitting in a room. But as the head writer, story editor, you're really kind of like the showrunner responsible for hearing pitches from the individual writers, right? Yes and no. You know, we we try not to call it showrunner because there's an entire other side to it where you've got like a supervising director handling like artists and art and storyboards and all that. And mm -hmm. generally, you know, they're fairly separate. You know, we've got a, a supervising producer that kind of manages both ends. Mm -hmm. 
So like a guy like Craig Kyle or a Josh Fine on Avengers would kind of, you know, oversee everything. Mm -hmm. And then I would be solely responsible for the writing aspect of it. So I would I would come up with like the series Bible and help develop it. And then I would, uh, you know, hire writers and supervise writers and as well as writing episodes myself. So it's my job to make sure that, you know, everybody sounds like, you know, the character they're supposed to be and everything makes sense and, you know, everything's on time and, you know, manageable. You know, mm-hmm. for the uh, for the production side, so it's you know the the scripts are my responsibility, um, but uh, it was more that's where it kind of ended. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so when you're when you're in that position where you're hearing pitches, um, I know I I had a, a a bit of a discussion last week with the the animation writer who was on there, and and he talked about how there's often, especially later on in the series, open pitches where you just kind of are running out of ideas, and and you open it up to to people that you might not necessarily um, hear pitches from already. How would somebody break into that? How would a new writer get into a position where he could pitch on, on a series like that? You know, it's tricky. And it, 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 it definitely is tricky because, like, you know, there's it's true. Because, like, you know, with, with the Marvel shows, they're a little more... They're a little more serial, you know, mm-hmm. so there's always going to be like the mythology episodes where like this is like the the overreaching series arc, you know, so, these, you know, you know, your you know, your season premiere and your finale and it's all kind of tied together in a one larger story. And then there's random episodes that, uh, you know, are just kind of like the fun. You never want to say the word filler, but I mean, these are like the, you know, the, the one off stories. Mm-hmm. And I mean, like those are the, those are the ones you generally take the pitches for. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, there are agents that'll, you know, put people forward, um, or if, you know, you get a good recommendation from somebody from another writer, that kind of thing. But, you know, as far as, you know, the the story editors more or less hold the keys of the kingdom as far as writers go. So my advice is always find a story editor Hmm. and uh, make sure they know who you are. Yeah. Because it's, you know, it's hard because it's like, it's a, you know, it's a big job managing a show and you've never got enough time and... And the last thing you probably have time for is to read like some random script from someone you've never heard of. Mm. So it's it's tough. And but then at the same time, you never want to just shut somebody down because you were in that position once. You know, we've all been there. Mm-hmm. And uh, and tell me a little bit about. Um, I know up here in Canada, and then the last uh, writer I spoke to was was uh, in Canada. He mentioned that there are no script minimums here. Um, even even though I mean, technically, it's it's. Uh, there's guild signatory productions and, and things like that, but that it's not the same kind of um, protection at the script level covered by the union. What what about in the states? No, there's nothing like that. <laughs> On like non-union daytime animation, mm-hmm. no, it's not it's not covered by Writers Guild or or much of anything. Mm-hmm. They, you know, I, I think I've worked on in, in my career like one show that had any kind of like uh, any kind of thing like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, is is that something that you'd like? To have, oh or, sure, of course. Yeah. But I mean, it's you know, it's the, you know, the cost of it is such that they, you know, I don't know a ton about the business end of it, but mm-hmm. it's something that studios obviously are not particularly interested in. Yeah, that may change. Hopefully, you know, the Writers Guild will find a way to make this happen. You mm-hmm. know, because obviously we would all like that as writers. Yeah. But uh, but it is we're not there yet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and so it, I I guess then your agent would play a big role in in negotiating your rates or or how uh, how does your agent play into this? Yeah, I mean the bottom line is that there's kind of an average, you know, for for one episode of uh, an animated series, and then you know if based on experience or or love or whatever it's <laughs> going to be, you know, your agent can press for more money, and you know you'll just it's a negotiation. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, some places are happy to negotiate. Some people love to do it. Some people don't. You know, it's it, it's it's case by case. Really. Mm. Cool. At least that's my experience of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, let's jump over to comic books a little bit. It, um, I, I noticed in particular that you did an adaptation of Ender's Game. Yes. The, tell, tell me about, I mean, obviously this is completely different working from... Uh, well, I guess it's not completely different because because always you're adapting characters, but but talk about adapting a a, a property like that, Ender's Game. 
You know, it, it was an interesting experience because I'd never done an adaptation, like a pure adaptation like that. You know, mm. with, the, with the Marvel end of the series, you get a lot of inspiration from various stories and various characters. But this is the first one where I was like, this is a full-on adaptation. Mm. And, I mean, the book has a huge following. It's a sci-fi classic. And, you know, my brother, I know, personally loves the book. And so I'm like, I'm in. You know, I want to I wanna be a part of it because the work is so amazing. Mm-hmm. And it was really just, you know, taking, to me, like the goal was to just be as truthful to the book as I possibly could. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the challenge is making it work for another medium. Because, you know, obviously with the book, your imagination does have to work. Whereas in this one, we really kind of had to, like, know what this world was and, like, you know, the details. And and honestly, all credit goes to Pascal Ferry on this one, the artist on the book, because Mm -hmm. it's... While I uh, obviously had to make it work for page counts and, you know, great cliffhangers and stuff like that and just finding the structure of it, like, he, like, had to design that whole world, you know? Because the book is, you know, it's it's all about the character and fairly sparse on, like, you know, how things looked necessarily. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, it was a great experience. I mean, it was definitely a learning experience, and, and, uh, you know, I think we did a good job. Very cool. And then in 2009... Um, there was the debut of now when you say creator owned original graphic novel Killer of Demons, that means that was that was your baby from scratch, right? That was my baby from scratch. I uh Killer of Demons was a concept that I came up with and thought it'd be a fun comic book and you know, I I put together the funds for it and found and hired an artist and paid the artist and paid the colors and paid the letters and hired kind of a a production uh, guy named Tom Maurer who put it all together for me. And uh, we, you know, kind of willed it into creation. Image Comics, who's a great shop for publishing, they do like Walking Dead and all kinds of, you know, independently created and owned uh, comic books. And Mm -hmm. they were kind enough to uh, publish this one. And, And it was very well received, I hear. People seem to like it. You know, I think generally if people read it, they liked it. Mm-hmm. So not, not that many people read it, but the ones that did liked it. And that's yeah. the important part. Cool. Very, very cool. And now you're working with the Marvel Writers Program? Yes. The uh, Marvel Studios, like the feature end that did like Iron Man and Iron Man 2 and Thor and Cap and all those fine movies, they're always, you know, looking forward and trying to figure out what's next. And they, they put together a writers program where... They would hire a handful of writers and they would just, you know, take the comic books and, you know, sift through them and and see what uh, they could do with it. You know, there's thousands of characters in the Marvel library and and we kind of go through and see, you know, what can we make a movie out of? You know, it it may happen, it may not happen, but, you know, we're, we're always developing new stuff and writing scripts and outlines and stories and, you know, just seeing what we can do. Very exciting because, I I mean, I, I know, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of, of Marvel movies. I think they've done an incredible job the last few years. Um, I mean, just hit after hit after hit. Um, and so obviously that department's doing well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they, um, they've they had, you know, Kevin Feige's uh, heading it up, and they've got a great executive team, and they've gotten great talent, John Favreau and Ken Branagh and... Uh, you know, they, they, they're doing everything right, you know, by getting people that are passionate about the projects and and creative. And it's been amazing. Like, as a fan, mm-hmm. like, it's been fantastic. You know, oh, yeah. it's, uh, it's just it's just a joy to see all these things come to life. Very, very cool. Well, um, the the end of the podcast, we usually talk about breaking in tips. And, um, and so, obviously, everybody has a, a unique path into the industry. Um, but if somebody was wanting to break in right now, what would you tell them? To which aspect of it? Uh, well, in, in particular, I, I mean, this is a TV writing podcast, so primarily series animation. Um, and, and in particular, not necessarily, but in particular, if you could comment about um, like the Marvel Studios or, or um, one of these bigger companies. You know, I, I would say with, with series animation is, you know, watch the shows, know what's out there. And look at the credits, you know, who's the story editor, who are the writers, and then, you know, learn as much as you can about it, and, you know, you contact them, you know, I mean, like the internet is a, is a small place, you know, a lot of these guys have Twitter or Facebook, and you never want to be pushy, and you never want to be creepy, and you never want to, like, full-on stalk people, but, I mean, you know, as a writer, it's these are, these are the gatekeepers, you know, you've got to... 
the people that hire writers on these shows are the story editors. So mm. you have to, you know, be respectful and don't overdo it. Just don't send a script and say, hey, here's my script. Check it out. Because <laughs> that is not the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, introduce yourself. You know, if you're at a comic book convention or something and you run into somebody or, you, you know, there's a panel. You know, they always have, like, the TV animation panels. And if mm-hmm. you can introduce yourself to someone and say, hey, you know, I'd love to send you a sample. And and what might you be looking for in a sample? Uh, something awesome. You know, I want to read it and be like, you know what, that kicked ass. You know, they got the voice of the show right. They got the action right. You know, they got the format right. They knew what they were doing because, I, you know, there's always a learning curve for sure. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, like, you know, it's we want to see just something that makes us smile and makes our lives easier. Yeah. You know, because at, at the end of the day, like, if you can make my life easier, you're in. Very cool. I would say, you know, uh, but definitely don't overdo it. You know, don't send 100 emails saying, did you read it yet? You know, just uh, <laughs> just uh, give it time because, you know, everybody's busy and, uh, you know, I, it's hard. It's hard to wait and it's hard to, you know, hear the silence sometimes. But uh, do your research, you know, try to find a script, you know, try to, you know, make sure you know the show you're you're doing your spec on. Mm-hmm. And I know um, in in live action, there there are internships every year. Are there any internships with places like Marvel Studios? You know, usually on the production side, mm-hmm. there are. On the writing side, not as much in my experience. Mm-hmm. But it's, you know, it's any any kind of in is an in. You know, yeah. I mean, if you can do an internship on the production side, I mean, it's, you know, it's case by case. I mean, sure, Warner Brothers TV has their world. and right, There's obviously Jeff. Nickelodeon does both, I guess. Do they? Yeah. Uh, great. Yeah. So, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, as Marvel TV grows and we do more animated series and more live action series, hopefully that'll become a, a, a thing, too, because I think that's a, a great thing. Mm. Very, very cool. And, oh, speaking of Twitter, are, are you on Twitter? I am. I am simply Yoast. Yoast? So y O S T? Yep. I love that. Very simple. <laughs> Easy to remember, too. Great. Well, um, I think we're coming up to our time here, uh, unless there's anything else that you'd like to mention. Uh, no, just thanks. It's a blast to talk about all this stuff, and uh, thanks for everyone who watches and reads. Great. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time, and uh, it's great to hear a different perspective, um, and especially about these exciting Marvel and, and DC titles. I'm sure there are lots of people who would love to be working on these shows. So uh, so appreciate you sharing your perspective. My pleasure. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, Christopher. All right. Thank okay. you. Okay. Bye-bye. Hosted by Gray Jones, the TV Writer Podcast is brought to you by Script Magazine and ScriptMag.com, the leading source for script writing information in print and on the web. And by Final Draft Script Writing Software, the entertainment industry standard for script writing worldwide. 